Hello, welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. As a reminder, the thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, you can say hello and hi, or both of those, to the Facebook stream. So hello and hi to all of you in Facebook land, as well as on YouTube land. So good evening to all. So let's see. Let's get right to it. Uh, my name is John Ruark. I'm a past master of the Patriot Lodge, number 1957 in Fairfax, Virginia. And next up for his introduction, Jason Richards. Hello and good evening. Hello and good evening. Jason Richards here, past master of Vacation Lodge, number 16 in Clifton, Virginia, and member of the Colonial Lodge number 1821 in Washington, D.C. Well, great. Good to have you. So let's see. Hammy, you are up next. Hello and good evening. Hello, Hammy. Mike, the intern, Mike Hambrecht, uh, whatever you want to call me. Just don't call me late for dinner. Um, <laughs> senior warden and lodge education officer for Lakeshore Lodge number 307 and the senior steward for Castle Island Virtual Lodge. Nice. Good I was evening, gonna, everyone. I was going to use the joke, whatever you, know, don't, whatever you call me, don't call me late for lodge. And I was going to make a COVID yeah, joke, but then, go. wait a minute, you can't be late for uh, civil. You just, just <laughs> click a button. You, you can be late for that. Uh, good evening, yeah. Robert. How are you tonight? Stand by. Go. I'm doing great. How are you, John? Uh, Robert Johnson here from uh, Past Master Waukegan Lodge, sitting secretary over at Space Novum, 1183 in Libertyville, Illinois, and the uh, host of the Whence Came You podcast. Thanks. Okay. Excellent. And our special guest for tonight, we have Worshipful Brother Cameron Adamson, um, from let's see your past master of uh harmony lodge is that correct uh yeah past master of harmony 579 and windsor lodge 403 uh currently the secretary of uh harmony lodge both of which meet at the windsor masonic temple here in windsor ontario i was going to say under the jurisdiction of what grand lodge uh the grand lodge of canada in the province of ontario Hooray! So you're like the third uh, Canadian that we've had on here. So congratulations. Good to be here. Although, you know, the thing about Windsor is, um, if you look on, on the map, Windsor is actually the only city south of the States. It's right next to Detroit. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, uh, you know, people, we feel we're very close to America over here. So we're kind of of two worlds. <clears throat> the best of both worlds. We're two countries. Yes. There you go. <laughs> well, this is great. Um, so before we get into tonight's show, let's uh, give a special shout out to the patrons who've been supporting the show. It'll be very relevant as we find out later this episode. Um, but for us, we really use, uh, really do appreciate it because we use it to upgrade tech and um, just keep this this hosting costs way down so we can keep this, doing this for a long time. So thank you, thank you, thank you. If you want to support the show, head on over to patreon.com slash the Masonic Roundtable and chip in a few bucks. We'd love to see you in our little secret access. So see you there. That brings us to tonight's topic, which is <clears throat> one that uh, I know Jason and uh, Cameron had when they uh, were recently, I think what you guys did a little podcast, a little episode of something recently. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I've had, I've been lucky enough to have two two of the uh, Knights of the Round Table on the Square and Compass podcast, uh, Juan Sepulveda and Jason uh, Jason Richards, um, and yeah, with Jason's in particular, we we kind of discussed this um, this idea of a a professional component or element to the craft. I just got to say, uh, maybe it's because uh, he's got a. a uh, maybe people like his face or something, but Jason's uh, episode did very well on, uh, in terms of uh, views, one of the higher ones for my, my podcast so far. And good just, watch time, too. People watched the whole thing. Yeah, it was all the same people buying GameStop stock, so they're just inflating the numbers. Don't worry about it. I'll, we're going to short that episode later, so don't worry about it. <laughs> but no. It was, yeah, uh, we, have, we, have a, we have a Reddit group called uh, Watch Jason on YouTube. <laughs> it has one subscriber, Jason. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and lots of bots. Uh, so yeah. cool. 
So, so I think it was a conversation that you guys had after a great conversation on your podcast. We said, why don't you bring us over and we'll talk a little bit about what it means to be a quote unquote professional Mason, right? What if, like, what is income look like? So, you know, the way that I think we could start the conversation is, is kind of the eternal question is, is it right or wrong to profit from the craft? Um, because that's, that's a, a very wide net because, uh, I mean, regalia has been sold since, you know, George Washington was a Mason. So we really need to think about um, what are the ethics of being a quote unquote professional Mason in any capacity whatsoever. Um, so Hammy, do you think it's ethical to profit from the craft? Well, you know, it depends on what you're charging for is the answer I can give you. Now, the fact is though, uh, authors are entitled to pay for their work. If you write a book, you're entitled to pay for it. doesn't matter what the topic is. You're entitled to it. If you're an artist and you're doing uh, paintings or sketches or, you know, even doing the artwork straight to aprons, you know, you're entitled to pay for your work, period. You know, um, if it's, you know, there, there are some things that I would sit there and go, well, are you really entitled to make money off this? In other words, if you're a guy who knows a lot about the craft and your job is to travel around the country to different lodges and do their lodge education and you're charging for that, I'm going to say, unless you're charging your just your airfare and room and board, okay, you, you know, that's fine. But if you're charging, you know, like a thousand dollars a pop or something, you know, well, we're you know, I'd say you're doing something wrong. I completely disagree. <gasps> and let me tell you why. It's all, it all comes down to economics and supply and demand. So if you have a, a price that you are charging for a service that you provide, uh, all, other, all else being equal, if you are charging an exorbitant price, um, you will find that your services are not in demand. So you'll lower your price until you reach that market equilibrium of your, you having enough demand for your services at, you know, at, you know, whatever price that ends up being when it trips into unethical behavior territory is when you are using your status as a Mason to guilt other people into procuring your services. So, you know, I, and I, and I don't see where that comes into play if you are selling Masonic education, because honestly, when it comes to Masonic education, like if, if people don't want to pay for you, they won't. But, you know, going up to, to brethren and saying, Hey, you need a plumber and, I'm a plumber, so you should, you know, use my services. And the other guy's like, well, you made it worse the last time you came out. So I, I think we really, we really do ourselves a disservice when we expect brethren to pick our work or pay us a certain amount because of our status as Masons. But if we are selling a service or providing a service and our service is... Uh, desirable in the market or someone is willing to to pay for that service outright i i don't see where that's a problem yeah i mean uh, I, i'm an ethical uh but ethical person but also a free market person as well and and you know um you know, i even struggle with this let's let's take freemasonry off the table um I, being being kind of a religious person as well i've thought thought years ago like why is it that christian books aren't free Right. If someone's a Christian author and they want to help spread the good word, shouldn't they be giving the book away for free? <laughs> right? Matthew like, ten eight says they should. There you go. So, but yet, the, it, you know, I, I challenge you to go find a a popular Christian book that is not, you know, some nominal cost. So, um, so what does that really tell you? That it's uh, wearing my economics hat. <clears throat> all prices are are signals. They're they're. They are indicators of value. They're indicators of um, desires of both producers and consumers, right? And I'm going to nerd out on the econ talk, but 
it's really important when you realize that um, the the ethics of selling something uh, has to be <clears throat> separated from is there a market for it in the first place? So if people want it, yes. they're going to get it, right? So if um, if if it's not someone who has good intentions or someone um, who you know is trying to do the right thing and spread good knowledge. Um, you see this all the time. <clears throat> Perfect example of non-Masons selling rings and aprons and gear all over Facebook. All these Facebook ads, people that were not not Masons whatsoever, they're just trying to make a quick buck. Market's there. Ethically, they're not a Mason. They don't care. So there is a demand, but it's not being met and they're by equilibrium in the market. So non-Masons are going to take advantage of this this equilibrium that's why black markets you know arise so uh so in conclusion right this is this is what it's all about when you think about um if there's already demand signal for more podcasts books regalia and all that like why not i mean that's that's really the end of the day is um whether or not you you think it's good bad or indifferent it is uh, one of my uh one of my uh podcast that i listen to is uh gary, gary vaynerchuk and he says don't you know don't sit back and think about the good old days like oh all my kids are on their devices all the time so is everyone else's kids so just try, <laughs> stop trying to stop trying to force it to what you want it to be and accept it for what it is and play within those rules so that's that's kind of my two cents cameron what do you think about that i i agree i think kind of the key thing like before the, the, the kind of the ethics in the marketplace come in, I always start with the with my premise for the last five years or so. I joined in 2007. So this is my premise kind of based on my experiences so far. Um, you know, I view Freemasonry primarily as a skills based endeavor. So I view Freemasonry in the same light as I would view music or martial arts or sports, or writing, or painting. Um, it is, it's first and foremost a skills-based endeavor. And with any endeavor like that, people will have different passion levels for it. But what you see in all those other endeavors that I mentioned, I talked about, is there is a professional component there. Now, the fact is most people within that endeavor aren't doing it professionally right most musicians aren't professional musicians or they try to become professional and they're not able to make it for any number of reasons whether it's they're not as skilled or life gets in the way or bad luck but there is a a professional component backstopping it and i think you know for better or worse the current masonic paradigm we have which is a you know, volunteer organization that is, there's no avenue. So if a musician wants to become a professional musician, there's an avenue by which he can theoretically get there. Uh, there are a lot of hard work and sacrifice and all those other things. It's theoretically possible to become a professional musician. Right now, there's so little by way of a mason. If a mason wants to dedicate himself to Freemasonry, the way a musician dedicates himself or herself to music, there's really no path right now. And I think that's the challenge. And that's why I admire, for example, the Masonic Roundtable. It's trying to find a way to bring a quote unquote professional element to the craft, even though, you know, the money that you raise via Patreon and, and as goes back into the product, uh, it's still about producing something that, that you know, pays for itself, has a, a professional component to it in that way. You know, I I just don't see how, you know, I talked about this with a few of my podcast guests, how it is that, first of all, which is the way the world is nowadays, we can necessarily expect men to be Freemasons, quote unquote, on their own time without some type of potential for professional avenue. Because since the 1970s, you know, wages are stagnating, which means you have two income households, which means you have longer hours for same or less pay. 
Um, so the amount of time uh, a man has anyways for uh, non-professional endeavors is already low. But also, I just think a lot of um, the, the professional avenue, what professionalism does is it creates a backstop. It creates a reason to adapt and change, maybe not core principles, but it, to, to adapt and change to modern times. I mean, to use the music industry, how many times since I, I was born 83, how many times have I heard, you know, the music industry is going to die? because of file sharing, because of cassette sharing back in the day, because YouTube and whatever it is, but it always finds a way to come back because there is a professional component to it that pushes it. I mean, without that professional component, I'm sure, for example, my favorite band is Leonard Skinner, right? Without that professional avenue, I'm sure Leonard Skinner would still have played music, but the only people that would have heard it would have been whoever happens to be in Texas at the bar on a Saturday night to hear them play live. There would be no distribution of it to a wider audience. And so I think that that professional component, what it does is it forces people, because there's money involved somewhere and a livelihood involved, to adapt to the times. I mean, just to go back to the music one more time, if, so I'll use Ontario as an example, and I should remind everybody, I don't speak for the Grand Lodge of Ontario. This is just me. But in Ontario, we went from a height of 100,000 Masons approximately to 33,000 presently. Imagine if you heard that the number of musicians had dropped by 70%, right? People would be freaking out because there's a lot of livelihoods and a lot of people who rely on the music industry. But meanwhile, you know, we dropped by 70% and still dropping. And we're still talking about the same paradigms that we've always used that, in my opinion, clearly aren't working. So there needs to be, I think, not, you know, not everybody should be a professional mason, just like not everybody should be or wants to be a professional musician. But there needs to be that component available and that option available if people want to pursue it in that way. Yeah. Go ahead, Robert. I was just going to mention there's there's a lot of talk here and in, in what people are I think sometimes need to be reminded of is that almost everything in the United States in terms of ritual happened because somebody did exactly what you're talking about, right? Like Preston, Webb, Smith, these guys created rituals, went around, made a book, gave their rituals, gave them their book, and they just became adopted. I mean, they're like the, the ultimate kings of this. And when my frustration is, uh, is when we talk about things like this, because I, I completely agree with you, um, just <laughs> I think it comes down to uh, an individual Mason's exposure to the Masonic world around them. Uh, in general, there's like this weird medium level of masonic you know somebody who lives the masonic life who lives in this bubble that doesn't go beyond the confines of their own particular jurisdiction and without doing that they're not they don't get the exposure to the amount of things out there that are maybe contrary to what their own Grand Lodge or their personal mentor told them as an idea, which is just an idea and not a rule or whatever. And these like biases. <laughs> Women in Freemasonry. <laughs> Don't get me started. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just one of those, it's unfortunate. It's like a dissonance that builds up over time. And I don't know. I think you, I think you put it really well. Um, just in terms of what it would add to the craft. Like I've always asked myself, what if you had paid lecture guys? Yeah. It'd be like the top dog. Well, well, see, that was just what I was getting ready to go. Um, when I was, uh, when I was master, you know, the greatest year ever in masonry, the, I, I was, I, I said, let me go for the top. Let me get, see if I can get Hodap, see if I can get Brent Morris to come. In fact, I got both of them that year, which is pretty, pretty cool. 
Um, Hodap happened to be in town for Masonic Week, so I scooped him up and all that. You know, asked him what his his needs were, and it was you know obviously transportation and sell my books, uh, and then you among know, thought, other things. Yeah, but I mean, well, yes, there's always there's always extras. Um, but then <laughs> there uh, I had Brent Morris come down from Maryland, which isn't too far from from Northern Virginia, and um. I thought, man, I got Brent Morris to show up. Like, I'm sure he's going to want to charge a lot. I mean, dude could probably charge whatever he wanted to, uh, within reason, because he's kind of a, a big deal, right? He was, he's the guy on the TVs, right? Him him and Chris Hodap. So, like, I could see there being a time, if there was, if not nail, then earlier, that they could have actually, actually shown up and said, I, I want an honorarium. I want, you know, at least it to be worth my time and... and when you think about that, it's not just, you know, selling books or whatever, but like, you know, this is how much I'm getting paid at work and I'm taking four hours of where I could be making money, you know, doing something else. I'm doing it at Lodge. So the least I could, could ask for is my usual rate. Opportunity cost. Opportunity cost. Another economics term. And I, I do think, you know, the other thing I think people sometimes, when, when I talk about like a, a professional component to Freemasonry, whatever that may look like. And there's different ways that component can be be structured. Um, I think sometimes people automatically you know, assume that that the mercantile uh, will be the main cause. But I think when any whenever you have any skills based endeavor like Freemasonry, the first thing that comes will be passion. Um, so, like, you'll never be able to to convince me, for example, that Stephen King doesn't love writing. Uh, you know, he's not, and he wrote about this uh, in uh, the forward to his book Skeleton uh, Skeleton Crew, I believe it was. You know, he he was writing when he was not making anything, and he didn't write his first, you know, bestseller, Carrie. He didn't write that for money. He didn't know it would make money. Uh, he wrote it because he had to write. Uh, same thing with martial artists, with musicians. You know, the passion comes first, and any money that may come, or fame for that matter, usually, and it, the best musicians, the best writers, it comes years and years after after they start. So it's not to suggest, and this is something I think people mistake, it's not to suggest, you know, John Smith joins Freemasonry on Monday, he's initiated, and by Tuesday, he's earning an income or living from it. In my opinion, just like with anything else that matters, and Freemasonry definitely matters, there should be years, if not decades, of work and dedication put in on a you know purely voluntary or training level, call it what you want, before any type of professionalism is considered. Um, it should be done first and foremost because it's you love to do it. And you can always tell those people. I think in any profession, in any endeavor, you can tell the people who join something because they want to be famous or because they want to be rich versus the people who join something because they love it and care about it. And that comes across in work, that comes across in their efforts. Um, so I think that's something people, you know, eventually having a pathway to professionalism and an income doesn't equate with not loving the thing and not doing it for the right reasons first. Right. Yes. And the only way to do that making sure there's a sufficient time period, right, between first joining and then a professional element. Nobody should be an EA and even consider, you know, earning an income. Yeah, so so really the, you know, my mind's starting to to wander into like all sorts of like, okay, let's, go, let's just say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you guys think about this too, because I think it'll be a fun thought experiment. Uh, let's just say you, you, you've done your time, you, you've, you've, gone through gone through the degrees gone through the east right you're past master now and you're like i've it, provincially i've done everything i could do uh in in my my lodge um and so you wake up one day and you say hmm i would love to be like a professional mason like a full-time mason make my money doing the thing i love which is masonry right so like what would be the profit maximizer that that you could do to help like you know, really start to go in. So you wouldn't just dabble with like, hey, I'll, I'll uh, 
I'll sell cufflinks, you know, or something like that, just to start. No, like, what would it? What would be the big thing? And 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 the first thing that kind of comes to mind is, like, what would what is something that would really sell by itself, even if it didn't have the Freemasons like tied to it? Because you know, Masons like to buy anything with a square and compass on it. <laughs> but that being said, like, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a whole like Assassin's Creed game? based on the Freemasons, right? We talk about the Templar connection, blah, 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 blah. But, like, purely focused on the whole, the whole game is nothing but, but you know, Freemasons and, and going through all this, this stuff and going and going through these grand, you know, these lodge buildings and all that. I mean, that would be a fun game to play by itself. That, that would probably sell some, some product, even to non-Masons. So, like, that's, that's what I'm thinking about. What other opportunities are out there if you wanted to actually be, like, a full-time professional mason what what else do you guys think could could really get out there and be a profit maximizer i i don't know if anybody else i've been thinking about this a little bit i don't know if anybody else wants to to jump in first because go for I, it i you know, i think that to me there's kind of three possible avenues for Kind of developing a, a professional Masonic space or component. Um, the first, and some of them are are completely in-house internal to Freemasonry. The first two, and then the third one is more it expands more out. So, I do think it'd be a hard sell because we've all, I'm sure, been in lodges where there've been these debates. But you increase your dues to a country club, golf club level, um, and then part of those dues go to pay wages for certain brothers in either you can make it like a, a separate position or you could work out some of the income for the masters and the junior and senior wardens. Um, something to that level, I think that's one possibility, in which case, you know, a brother hopefully would have to show a great deal of time and effort and work before he's even considered for any chair, let alone a chair that has a money attached to it or income attached to it right now i think we've all seen times where the lodge is desperate so people have to be pushed forward because they don't want to you know they want to move people up to keep the chairs filled hopefully if there's a an income of some sort attached to it you know that you're gonna have to put a lot of work and time and dedication in to get to that even lower chair the other option and i call this kind of the the moby dick option i can't remember the name now of the the whaling ship in the uh, in the novel, but all whaling ships back then basically they were corporations. They were floating corporations, and all of the profits that were were found were divvied up amongst all the people on the ship. But obviously, if you were a brand new crew member, you got a very, very, very small amount as compared to the captain. Uh, so you do something similar where you have like an investment. Uh, you invest in the market. Obviously, there's risk because it can be not always the most stable thing, but you invest and then everybody gets a dividend. And the more experienced you are, the higher up in the chairs, that's a decent dividend. And if you're brand new, you maybe get a small amount, but certainly not enough to be considered professional. And then the third, I think, is what you talked about is, you know, my suspicion is that, and I don't have anything to back this up beyond my suspicion, is that Freemasonry could attract an audience in the same way a cooking show attracts an audience. Like I enjoy cooking. I enjoy watching cooking shows, but I can't cook to save my life. And I suspect, you know, it's like the, the Joe Rogan uh, philosophy, right? Joe Rogan, I mean, he's the draw. Um, so maybe one day I'll have a scientist, the next day he has a, MMA fighter the next day. So if you can create content that's interesting, you know, Lex Freedom is another one. I'm really not very smart. I don't know the first thing about artificial intelligence, but Lex Friedman has a podcast on AI and I enjoy listening to it and watching it just because I enjoy hearing passionate people discuss the thing that they love. And then you can go on with that and, you know, add t-shirts, and products and scale model Masonic temples and video games, and you can branch out from there. But I think um, there is a market somewhere for passionate people discussing what they love 
that can attract a wider audience and then you get advertisers and all that type of stuff. So those are kind of my three my three ideas as to where I think the professional aspect can come from. I tend to go back and I think about the success where masonry kind of dropped off, but perhaps in some other organizations that started their existence, you know, maybe right around the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, with the advent of the spiritualist movement in America. Right. You know, we've, I mean, um, look, I'm, I'm not a, do not think I am shunning or talking bad about theosophy at all. I am saying, however, they have their own bookstores. They have their own print press. They have people who made careers out of lecturing at halls and going around and making, right? But, but the draw here, what's interesting is it wasn't bad to do that. In fact, those people energized and increased the output potential of everybody in those rooms. And then those people double down and those people become the bright shining stars of their lodges or wherever they're going. And so it's, it's somewhat interesting because today in Freemasonry with podcasts like your own, this one, or blogs that are out there, those blogs are putting ideas or concepts or ideas of excellence in people's minds. I'll call them the, the Masonic consumer mind. And they're taking those things back home and they're improving things. And so it's almost like the value is twofold. The value is like your, it's, it's a trade. And this is like the beauty of the, the, of, of you know, the basis of commerce, you know, uh, and it's there, even though people don't want to realize it. So in Freemasonry, where we have, we don't have, you know, tons of people on these mega book tours doing stuff like Theosophy had in the, you know, early 1900s. But what we do have are great lecturers who travel around. What we do have um, are um, a wonderful cadre of, of, of guys who are designing new stuff for Freemasonry, like, you know, whether that's regalia or pins or aprons or, I mean, like Ascended Masters Clothing has an intense amount of really original design t-shirts and stuff. And he knows his market, you know? So, so there's something about that. Masonic Revival does the same thing. Um, I'll give a shout out to Nathan Tweedy with with uh, his company, Two Pillars. It's like he knows the audience and he's got it. And I think it's perfect. And so I don't think there's any shame in it. If I was going to do something, I mean, I already kind of dipped my toes in it a little bit. Ben Williams and I have been talking about Wilmshurst University, do um, which would be like Masonic Masterclass, but open to anybody, not just Freemasons, you know. So that, that would be my idea. The Masonic Masterclass. There you go. I like that. <laughs> and it's coming. Mm -hmm. Hey, that sounds like something I should do on that uh, master's class program since I'm already taking it and know the format. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> we, we're going to need uh, lecturers, you know, paid gigs for you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, that there's another thing that comes to mind, too, when you talk about, like, professional masons, is uh, people who are actually, like, paid for by a Masonic institution. So the first thing that comes to mind are, like, Art de Hoyas, right? Um, uh, where, Mark uh, Tabbert. Mark Tabbert, paid for by a Masonic-affiliated or organization. They are getting their salary from from running those uh, the libraries or, or you know, the, the upkeep of the temples. Like, that's no joke. That is, like, an actual job with an actual salary. No, there's not. they're not, like, swimming in, you know, Scrooge McDuck vaults full of, of coins, right? Or Because, you know, dues are still low. But it is it is something that they actually get a full-time job doing. And, and, you know, we always kind of, when you walk through and you meet these guys, all humbles, all get out. But at the same time, you're like, man, how what a, what a cool job that would be to 
every day get to go to the George Washington, you know, Masonic Memorial and just see it, soak it in, be right there in the library with, with texts, you know, that are since the beginning of Masonry. I mean, come on. That's 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 worth a little something. I'd pay to let I'd pay for them to let You'd pay me do them. That. <laughs> that's not how this works, Sammy. You're, you're gonna you're gonna lose money doing that. No, there, there's there's definitely like it's one of, a professional Freemasonry or a professional component to the craft. It's one of those ideas that is new but not really. I think the issue is a, an issue of scale. Um, the the number of I think those types of professions are just, I mean, Jason, in our podcast, right, you, you use the word minuscule, which I think is correct. There's just so few. Uh, and the casual Mason, or not yet, the casual Mason or the brand new Mason won't be aware of them. And that could be partially the fault of the lodge lodges for not making them aware. But when you, for the average uh, man on the street, when he say walks into a pawn shop and sees guitars on the wall, he thinks of Eddie Van Halen, he th or, uh, John Lennon, uh, you know Eric Clapp. Like pick your, he thinks of those. When he sees uh, books, he thinks of Stephen King. He thinks of uh, Michael Crichton. If he happens to see a Masonic apron, who does he think of? Who is the Dan person Brown. that he sees? As he Dan Brown, That's right? Democratic. And I don't even think Dan Brown. Is a, I don't even think Dan Brown is a Mason. You know, he may think he's not. not if he knows, history. yeah, I didn't think so. Yeah, which no, I'm I'm all for Dan Brown writing those books. I thought they were great. They, but you know, who does? You see, you know, you see a guitar, and even if you can't play, you think I'm going to learn because I want to be like Van Halen. You see a book, you think I'm going to learn to write because I love Stephen King. You see a Masonic apron, who do you think of? Who George is the Washington person? George Washington. I even then, I bet you a lot of average people don't know that George Washington was a Mason, uh, and that's you know, I, I think that's the problem. There's no path there's no person or, or group that people can look to and say the average you know non-educated mason brand new mason can look at and go i'm going to spend 50 60 hours a week at this i'm going to forego sleep and i'm going That's to like forego family because i want to be that guy it's like that romantic idea where we always say like uh <clears throat> people will know a Mason in public by his deeds and the way he acts. You know, they always, they always kind of sit on these, this kind of like Laurel rosy glass thing, you know, and Wait, I just they'll like, know we are Masons by our love, by our love. I, I don't know what that is, but maybe um, I just think that kind of, it, it's an old it Christian. Him. Okay. Yeah. I don't, you know me, man. I'm not going to know that. <laughs> no, I <laughs> failed. But where I'm going with this is that they don't have any good DS Tims these days. <laughs> there are no DS Tims. It's the sound of the trees. Yes. Uh, it, it just feels like I'd never really thought about that. You know, when if I see the Masonic ring somewhere, what am I thinking? Is anybody is you know the 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 weird pessimist grumpy past master in me thinks if when I see a ring, I would I would suspect somebody to go yeah. I look forward to being an old guy eating hot dogs in a lodge with, you know, a weird smell one day. Yeah. That's what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> what if you see beans to go Whoopi Goldberg wearing? A Masonic jacket. That comes right. quite, quite a right. face and this week. Stolen valor. And I do, <laughs> but that's a, that's an interesting point. Like, the Whoopi Goldberg thing. That like that stuff like that drives me crazy because here you've got, um, and I don't I don't watch you myself, but I know a lot of people do. Here you've got. You know, Whoopi Goldberg, who I love Star Trek The Next Generation, so she's awesome. You know, wearing this jacket, 
and I go on my Facebook feed and you have all these people freaking out. Why would you not, you know, the, the Prince Hall, I believe it was Prince Hall Masons, why would they not reach out to her and be like, would you like to come and take a tour of our building for your show? Exactly. Thank you so much. For Absolutely. It. You mean and instead of uh, beating her up on Twitter the way they did? Yeah, they, they, yeah, they ate her up. There was no indication that she was, but from what I saw, no indication she was doing it in a mocking or unkind way. Didn't know. This is a chance to to show the charitable works and the good works. And I think this goes, I can guarantee you, if there was money on the table, like if bringing Whoopi Goldberg to a Prince Hall Lodge could generate additional income and revenue for those lodges, they might have a very different view. Ah, and yeah. it just may incentives, behavioral incentives. Like it, yes, and that absolutely. stuff just drives me. Crazy. But going also, I think going back to the, you know, when you see a guitar, you think of Van Halen. I also think the important thing to keep in mind with that is, when you see a guitar, you think of Van Halen not because he's Van Halen, but because of Spanish Fly, because they produce things that make the world better. And Freemasonry, you know, truly makes the world better and it produces things and men and ideas that make the world better. And people need to be aware of that. If for no other reason then, like, I don't know if you've noticed out in the world, but it's getting pretty divided out there. Like, if only there was some type of cultural institution that spanned 300 years that could bring people of different faiths and political views together, in harmony, right? Like, it's not uh, it's not a game anymore. A Masonic lodge and a Masonic temple are cultural and community touchstones that connect people across these lines that are getting ever more divisive. You know, there's this quote by uh, I think it was Voltaire, who the philosopher. He said, "You are responsible for all the good that you don't do," and I think what he meant by that is you can take it one of two ways. You can take it as every time, you know, you see a homeless person, you should automatically give charity no matter what. But I don't think he meant it like that. What I think he meant is if you allow an organization or group or yourself to become, you know, so moribund and so somnubalic, like just so sleepwalking through that you're not able to have the impact you could, you're responsible for that. And I think Freemasonry could be, it already is a force for good, but it could be a force for so much more good. We just need to dedicate, we just need a dedicated professional wing to make that happen. You know, the world is better when Freemasonry is strong, just like the world is better when there's music, the world is better when there's Masonic lectures. The world is better because of Freemasonry and it can be made more better and that means dedication, that means 40, 50, 60 hour weeks. That means no, sacrificing. Family. We're we're a volunteer organization. You know, we don't have time for that. Let's, John. Though, to your point, like I kind of feel where you're you're starting to go, and mm -hmm. I'm going to connect this one thing that drives mm -hmm. me crazy. Let's talk about a Grand Lodge that's got five hundred million dollar charity fund, and uh, and they're doing it professionally. They have a board of directors who directs that money. Now, take them out of Freemasonry and take that same $500 million charity, put them in the public space with a board. Okay, now Freemasonry is a $500 million charity, and they would love to give to charity, and they love when the public knows it. But if it wasn't Freemasonry, and let's say a board member was on social media platform and made derogatory comments about somebody professional in the professional world, that person is removed pretty quick. So I don't know how to, to tie this back. I mean, it's kind of like a holistic idea or a cloud that I'm, I'm forming. But if we are going to be professional, we have to act like it. Yeah. But we tend to pretend that we're professional. Yeah. Is it, is it easier to be insulated in mediocrity than uh, try to excel and fail? I really like that term, insulated in mediocrity. I think you I think that's a very good way to describe um, Freemasonry in general. The crap. Uh, 
Yeah. yeah, the craft as a whole, not on an individual level, because there are a lot of Masons doing excellent work, but the craft as a whole there, has kind there of are gone to the of brilliance. Yeah, there are pockets of excellence and pockets of brilliance. Go ahead, Cameron. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, I, that's absolutely right. Yeah, that there are, there are pockets of excellence and pockets of brilliance, but I think the craft as a whole is far too often, you know, comfortable in mediocrity. And again, the way I, I, I phrase that was, it's not necessarily a bad thing because we do, we are charitable, right? Um, when you look at the charities, that could, like count, count Shriners hospitals aside, because that's is kind of the biggest Masonic charity. We do lots of local provincial charity as well, but but, um, you know, large nonprofits that are in it to maximize donor donations, etc. Like they do it much better. Let's call it for what it is. Um, it's great to be charitable, and we've talked about what it means to be a charitable Freemason uh, you know, many times on the show. Uh, but again, we're not we're not always saving lives. If that makes sense. You see where I'm going with that. You no, know, I, I agree. You know, I remember uh, one of my one of those times when I got quite annoyed. Um, this was about four, six years ago, maybe. It was a Scottish Rite meeting, um, and they brought in a speaker, and he wasn't uh, a Freemason himself. So they went to, you know, they went to a refreshment, and, and they brought him in. And he was a millennial, and he was also responsible for advertising with this this firm or marketing. And he had done his research beforehand to his credit and he came up and he said, look, I've done the research. People aren't joining of my generation. And if this keeps up, you're not going to be around in, you know, uh, 30 years or something to that effect. And he, he talked about maybe some possible reasons why and how to attract people who are a younger generation. And then he left and somebody stood up and said, I love being a Freemason. We don't need to change anything. We're all fine. Like as though pointing out that this isn't going to last forever if we don't make some paradigm shifts or some changes, that was viewed as an attack on the craft, as opposed to pointing out, hey, the craft isn't all that it could be. Um, and I love pancake breakfast, but I can't have another one that's not going to solve the problem. So, so and that's kind of where I was going earlier about like behavioral incentives and the economics, sorry. Uh, entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurs take the risk of mm -hmm. trying to create better future i mean everything you just said about about you know looking at the guitar and seeing van halen right that um they want to make the world a better place and so uh the the market rewards entrepreneurs doing that by by paying them right by giving by exchanging some sort of value for getting the value that was created by a great song a great performance a great charity whatever and so you know i'm trying to think like what if you know masons got paid a stipend or something uh depending on the impact they made in the world right what if they treated it like you know again you you have your your day job is to perform well enough that you don't get fired right and so there's some level of competency that's going to be expected of you regardless of what your salary is um because if you don't meet that comp competency standard, you're fired. You're out of the organization. So what if we had a minimum wage for Freemasons, <laughs> right? What if we had an expectation of you must create this much value to earn the square and compasses on your ring? Uh, or I don't know. Discounted, you discount your dues. Just discount the dues. There you go. It comes down. There you go. Hey, that'd be, that'd be a big well, I mean, I pay me. I don't even want to have to pay dues. If I'm going to work for this, right. you know, why should I even pay dues? Yeah, yeah. you know. I mean, um, I, what, hey, this work, isn't right to work, should, Ohio. You know. Right to work. <laughs> Look, okay, you pay yeah, dues if pay, you're in the, if if you're work, in the union. I might. Well, okay. I mean, I'm Sorry, not. I, mean, I, 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 get, I, I get that idea. I. I do worry, that kind of goes to my first professional component idea, which is you increase your dues to a sufficient amount to provide income for members based on however the lodge can decide it. The lodge can decide it's based on an officer position or, so 
my only concern is one, I, I've seen some of the debates about raising dues by $5, like let alone the amount that you need to create a wage, which drive me crazy, those debates, but I've seen them. And also, just again, my only concern with that would also be making sure that it's not a an automatic thing. Like I said, I think sure. it's it's instead of thinking it as a job, I really think it should be thought of as a, a skill based endeavor because a job you get an income as soon as you join. Like as soon as I start working at Seven uh, Eleven, I, I get a wage. You know, a skills based endeavor like music. Um, it takes years and years before, it should take years and years before right. money is even on the table. And I think, you know, it, for a professional opponent to work, it needs to be viewed more as a, an art or a skill-based endeavor that requires, you know, years, if not decades of grind and sacrifice before uh, money comes into it. But if somebody does I grind and sacrifice, though. okay. I mean, that that to me just like reeks of time and grade and the fact of the matter is you know if you're looking at you know services and quality of work like there are folks who have been doing masonry for 40 years who are never going to produce the quality of work that uh you know some on fire ea has done in his first ever research paper so you know i yeah, time and grade uh, philosophies are one of my big pet peeves. So I, I get that you need to know a certain amount and you need to have a certain amount of experience or skills. But, you know, putting putting a barrier to entry to a professional cadre of masonry by by saying it's something you have to work at for years and years and years, I think is a bit disingenuous. And, and that's fair. And that's a fair point. And I certainly think you could work it in such a way because in, in other skills-based endeavors, right, there are people who just, for whatever reason, because they got lucky, because God gave them, uh, the great architect gave them just a great bunch of genius skill uh, at the start, you know, they, they're able to advance quickly and maybe get to a place in music where somebody else may never get to or take years and years. So I don't think time should be the only um I don't think time should be the, the only consideration. It should be like a, one of many. And you can try to figure out, okay, how much do you want to base it on sacrifice versus natural skill versus um, you know, how friendly he is to lodge. Like the lodges have to decide for themselves. Um, I just, I do think there is something though, like, like road time is, is a real thing and it's a good thing. I was, uh, and still I'm involved with professional wrestling. and one of the times when you learn the most is on those five, six, seven hour car rides to the next show with the other guys talking, you know, like there is something you said for, for time. And maybe if a Mason joins and he's traveling around and with other Masons and spending those time with those older guys, he may be better able to appreciate and, and use the professional component. But yeah, time is only one factor of many. It's a, uh, it, it would be a matrix for sure. Okay. So, um, so we're at the point now where we get to our final question of the evening. And, uh, I mean, we've covered uh, a breadth of, uh, and depth of this topic. So I think it, it's um, one, one way to kind of close out is, is the question of, is, is work in itself, is the labor of the craft its own reward, right? Is it worthy enough for... Um, for there to not necessarily be professional Freemasons, as it were. But um, the, the, the source behind this is um, there is uh, one of the lessons in the uh, Southern uh, Masonic jurisdiction of, of Scottish Rite, where uh, they go through and really describe that work in itself, as a philo philosophical concept, work is its own reward. Um, you, you see examples, you see parables about this, right, with... Uh, you know, um, in the New Testament about getting paid different wages for different amounts of work. Um, but, but taking that context out is the fact of um, putting in, putting in your own effort, putting in, uh, being proud of something to accomplish, being proud of learning that lecture, being proud of raising new brothers, right? Is that, is that its own reward? So um, 
I'm going to hand it off to Robert for the first. Well, hold on. <laughs> you're going to add to the, that? No, I just wanted to, I wanted to read you the exact quote that you're okay. talking about. Thank you. Good. I couldn't find it right away. It says, work only can keep even kings respectable. And when a king is a king indeed, it is an honorable office to give tone to the manners and morals of a nation to set the examples of virtuous conduct and restore in spirit the old schools of chivalry in which the young manhood may be nurtured to real greatness. Work and wages will go together in men's minds in the most royal institutions. We must ever come to the idea of real work. The rest that follows labor should be sweeter than the rest which follows rest. So that's... uh, Part of the fellow craft in chapter two from morals and dogma but it it, it adds to what you're saying you know mm-hmm. so so that you've had time to digest that robert what's uh what's your take on that can you rephrase the question for me uh is work its own virtue yeah i mean the things my dad used to tell me were probably the same things you're dads or your moms or whoever told you which was get get a get a job and something you love and it never is work and so for freemasonry a lot of us do this for nothing at all um and by doing that um i think there's probably some people who will say they do it for the labor of love and then walk away after a period of time that they actually, they didn't get anything really because they kept saying that expecting to like somehow get paid anyway, if you know what I mean. Um, Yeah. I mean, I've seen it with a few Masonic authors over the last few years. Uh, within the last seven or eight years. I mean, I've witnessed that happen, but I've all, I've also witnessed people who give blood, sweat and tears to the fraternity, uh, for nothing at all. Um, <clears throat> I mean, and it does have its own reward in a sense. Um, I think about guys like Jared Stanley who did the, uh, what is a Mason podcast for a long time. That dude's the grand secretary now. I mean, that's a really neat reward. I mean, that he's like, that's, I mean, I don't know if he gets paid or whatever, but I mean, that is, <clears throat> excuse me, that is the reward is, is in that you get to work in the thing you love. Um, and I think if there's anything left over after that, if the fraternity throws you a bone, you know, as a secretary of my original mother lodge, I got paid five dollars per dues paying member at the end of the year. Woo-hoo. And I had over three hundred and fifty members. So I got a really nice check at the end of the year. But you know what? Uh I was working for the I mean, I, I work for the craft six hours a day anyway, but at that point it was even more because I had three hundred and fifty members I was making connections with all the time. And by the way, I wouldn't get paid on a member who was a lifetime or not a lifetime. uh, I wouldn't get paid on a member if they demitted. So there was like this weird incentive to make sure I was making contact with people, making sure that my dues notices were going out. People were paying them. It was an interesting thing. It was an incentive for lodge success. Like the lodge did well. And if the lodge did well in collecting dues, then, you know, Robert, thank you for your service this year. Thank you for making Waukegan Lodge 78, uh, um, you know, massive success this year. Uh, Hope this helps offset the cost. And by the way, that's in addition. I didn't pay for any materials. I didn't pay for envelopes. I didn't pay for anything. It is a gift, right? And so there are brothers out there who get, you know, a salary or a gift from lodges. And I support that. I think that's amazing, especially when those people are really doing the craft a, a great service you know your secretaries out there are the backbone of the fraternity but you also have those ritualists those guys who go lodge to lodge and make sure that you can get new members in 
You also have lecturers, guys who travel around. You guys got like uh, Jason Richards, who is Jason Richards was the first dude that I knew who gave an online Zoom presentation like five years before COVID. <laughs> uh, I was like, what? <laughs> That's crazy. And now it's everywhere. Um, is virtue its own reward? I think it is. But all good things, uh, you know, eventually come to you. What goes around comes around. And so I think, yeah, it's a, it's a really good thing. And I'm happy to work for the fraternity like, you know, almost a million other people are. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, if somebody throws you a $10 bill for something one time, that's awesome, man. What am I going to do with it? I'll probably, buy, uh, I'll probably buy two cups of coffee and I'll give one to a brother. You know what I mean? Right, <laughs> so, right. All uh, right. And you got a new book that came out, right? I did put a new book out. It's called How to Charter a Lodge, an Unsanctioned... Uh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know not, you, you caught me off guard. A no-nonsense, unsanctioned guide. Uh, it's about how to charter a lodge and some cool stuff in there. And my favorite part about it is we've got insights from a lot of uh, brothers and sisters uh, from around the world who uh, assisted in doing their own chartering exercises and things. Uh, among those contributors, the great Bob Davis, Ooh, Grandmaster. Nice. Excellent. What? Bring it up. Yeah. Excellent. All Author right. of the best analysis on contemporary ritual that exists today. A Mason's words. A Mason's, Mason's word, words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Over to you, Hammy. Um, what do you think? Is work its own virtue? Actually, yes. I, I, I'd be the first one to, you know, sitting here to say that. I mean, um, I do. I believe that a lot because, you know, um, you know, even my presentations that I've done here for this, I mean, that's, you know, just doing them and knowing that a lot of people like them, I, you know, is enough. Um, and, you know, the lodge educations I've done when I go in and do that, even for my uh, my own lodge or uh, other lodges throughout my district, and even my participation now in the uh, Grand Lodge Education Committee, you know, those are, you know, those are things that, you know, are their own reward and because the way they work, it, they compound themselves because, you know, as I said, I was doing logic. I mean, I've been in masonry almost five years now and I have uh, been doing lodge education ever since too. I was LEO for every year since I've joined now. And I've gone from just being an LEO to the, you know, the Grand Lodge Education Committee to doing presentations throughout my district, being called by different lodges going, hey, we heard about this one. Can you come give it, you know? And um, and actually now being invited to the uh, North Carolina Masonic Research Society to present for them. And, and a member of Castle Island Virtual Lodge where I was actually where I got my first, well, my second invitation to present because the first one was actually from you guys at the uh, 300 when I talked about, uh, you know, 1717 or 1721, you know. So, I mean, all of that stuff just kept building on top of itself. Plus then eventually getting, I mean, obviously being on the show too. So for me, that's, that's the truth in it. All righty. Let's see. Jason, is work its own virtue? Absolutely. I think one would argue that that's why most of us are here for for masonry most of us don't expect to get paid for masonry most of us um are are here to work and are here to make the world a better place and and that is very much its its own reward um but i think for for those folks who want to devote their soul, you know, vocation and, and, you know, 60, 70 hours a week to masonry vice just, you know, five to, to 10. Um, and they do so providing a service that has a market demand within masonry. I don't think we should look down on them for doing that. I, I don't think we as Masons should expect discounts or anything for free from brothers just because, hey, we're in the in club. I also 
don't think we should, that brothers should be an obligation to pay for our services um, when they are inferior, either in cost or um, value or quality to somebody else who's a non-Mason. Um, I think if, if there's a market and that market exists within Freemasonry and you have the ability to make Freemasonry your vocation due to, due to that market, then I think you're, you're well within your rights to, to try it and, and see what happens. Um, is work its own reward? Absolutely. But the amount of work that I can put in directly depends on whether or not that reward includes any sort of monetary component. There you go. If you want me to work for Freemasonry an hour to two a week, sure. Work is its own reward. If you it's... want me to devote 40, 50 hours a week, no. It's work for Freemasonry, not work for free masonry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ex yeah, exactly. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thanks, Jason. Uh, Cameron, yep. how about you? Is work its own reward? It it is. Uh, I I agree with exactly with what what Jason said. Um, you know, of course, especially when it is a a passion uh, or like it's a, an endeavor that you have passion for. Um, of course, it's going to be its its own reward. There's obviously things that people do solely to make money you know like the, they may not love their job but they do it because they need to to earn an income but there's always going to be things that um they do because they love it and they love it first and foremost and that's why they do it and i think the ultimate goal for anybody's life to me would be to find a way to combine that thing that you do because you love it with um some type of income so you can dedicate more time to it because ultimately um and especially since the 1970s but even before then you know the number of disposable hours you know uh, a man has in a day especially when you add on family is dropping because wages aren't rising and there's all sorts of you know two-income households so there needs to be uh, I think the goal for everybody would be to find a way to take the thing that they love and combine it with the thing that will earn them an income so they can dedicate more time to it. Um, and also the, the rewards from a professional component is just um, that idea of an incentive to adapt and to change. You may love something, but if you're not willing to look at it somewhat critically and say how can this be made better if there's no economic incentive to do that you may keep doing things the same way you've always done if and if it's not working and you see you know lower lower membership numbers or whatever it is that's why i brought up the music industry i think it's a great example um it's been you know people have been saying it's going to die since i remember the 19 early 1990s with tape sharing right it there's always an incentive for it to adapt and to grow and to look at the market and make uh, make it work. I think Freemasonry, while there's these spots of brilliance and excellence, uh, far too often has decided it's just more of the same. You know, pancake breakfasts are great, but we've had a lot of them, and they don't seem to be turning around the declining membership numbers in any real way. So, work is definitely its own reward. But you want to do, if it's thing you love, you want to be able to dedicate yourself to it full time and not also have to worry about food on the table and a roof over your head. So combining those two things, passion and income, I think is something worth trying and worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I would agree with you there. Thank you, Brother uh, Cameron, for your time. Um, it's been been awesome to have you on here. So I think keep up the good work with your podcast and uh, hope, to, hope to have you back on sometime in the future so uh, thank you so much well no jason it's not time so uh, <laughs> it, I, I get to say is virtue is, is is virtue sorry is work is its own reward is work is a, a virtue uh yes in some aspects you get you get a dopamine hit for a job well done right like when you complete a task you feel good right when you when you scratch something off your to-do list 
it does feel good. I mean, that's been scientifically proven uh, with that with the dopamine hit that that your brain releases. But um, we talked in a earlier episode this uh, this past month or so about uh, motivation in the craft and about how we rely on things that in a nonprofit, uh, non-paying organization to inspire through autonomy, uh, giving people a freedom to uh, to excel in their committees, autonomy, mastery, and purpose. That there's there's a certain amount of inherent uh, reward for doing that. And then and the last thing is, as uh, RJ was alluding to, was um, karma, right, and law of attraction, right. That uh, if you do a good job, it's going to come back to you, right? Uh, so that's really getting into the philosophical aspect of doing the right thing and doing it well. Eventually, it'll come back. Um, and also to build off of what Jason was saying it's uh, and what Cameron was saying, that doesn't feed families. That doesn't pay rent, right? So um, the really the, anal- the analogy that I started to think about when preparing for this, this question was, Okay, so again, as Jason said, you put in a couple hours uh, a week to, to help out the lodge. You know, even being master is is very very time consuming with all the things you have to do. Um, what what happens if you're like you're putting over forty hours a week, every week, into masonry? Um, do you think you're going to get good quality work out of that volunteer? Um, and so. I think you'll get work out of them, but you won't, you won't get the same quality as if they have their own 40 hour a week day job. Okay. So when is it enough that, when is it that you dedicate so much of your free time that it actually, uh, would be actually more beneficial to the lodge to pay someone to actually do it well. Um, you know, and that's the eternal debate too about, well, why, why should we pay for a lawn mowing service when we got the demolays? They can go cut the lawn. Yeah, they're not going to do a good job. They're going to hate it. It's going to take twice as long. Just pay, you know, the a good lawn service to come in and do it well, right? Um, and so it's at the end of the day, it's all about opportunity costs. If you're good at the craft, you should be rewarded at the craft, whatever that aspect is. And so that's uh, from the economics, the scientific approach, That's that's really what it boils down to, in my opinion. So... Uh, great discussion on uh, what a professional mason looks like and uh, I hope all of you find find that one niche that uh, makes it profitable uh, for you so with that I want to thank you all very much for watching and keep searching for more light have a good night